Olivia, I posted your five, your 1.5, 1.6 quiz. So okay. Um, okay. I'll check to see if. Yeah, it'll, it won't go up until after the class is over. What? I posted so that it will come up after class is over. Oh, okay. That's done uh, by tonight. That would be awesome. Okay. All right. Thank you. It's been a 45 minute. Adventure. <laughs> okay. Okay. Next year, AP Calc. Uh, I think I have to take IBSL. Okay, so you're an IB student. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I will. I will make that change on my schedule. Okay. Good. Glad I asked.
I think I'm going to have two of you. Are you on two different devices? Uh, no, I have no idea what's going on with that. Okay. I can try to leave and rejoin. Well, your other your other person's not really joining. Now just join. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I just see one of you though. Yeah, I think the other one left.
Okay, I have not it now. Let me just do this quickly. Let me just change the attendance and we'll be good to go. Okay, so everyone is here. Uh, everyone is here. Beautiful. Okay, so let me go back into this. Now let me share my screen. Yeah, I mean, it's so far away. Yeah, I need the charger. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so let me get this number seven, which is right here. Okay, so we can find number seven out too. So hang on one second. So I'm gonna stress both tests today, first and second derivative test, because um, that's where we're having the most um, inconsistencies, I wanna say. So looking at number seven, they said to conduct a first and second derivative test with sign charts and statements to sketch the function without using a graphing calculator to do that sketch. Okay, so when you get to seven, take first derivative, let me see my pen. Okay, back, oops, do that, get back up to seven again. Okay, so first derivative, I agree. You're going to factor it. You want to get your first derivative down to this. Okay, this is important for your first derivative. So you have both x minus 2 and then x minus 3. So your roots or your critical values are 2 and 3. So I'm good with that. I like the second derivative, and I like that he found the x of the inflection point and then found the whole inflection point. Okay, so here are the points he's going to use when graphing along with the y-intercept. Okay, so here's the test, and this is exactly what I want to see. Have your x on the line, you have 2 and you have 3. Then you're going to test the slope. Uh, to the left of two, so you would plug in a one in here, in this form, and you're going to see that it's negative times a negative, which gives you a positive. Then plug in a 2.5, also in this form, and that's going to give you a positive times a negative, so that's going to be a negative. Then plug in like a four in the same place, and that's going to give you a positive times a positive, which is a positive. So I totally agree with that. And down here is your f of x. That looks good too. Okay, so many, many of you, I'd say 90% of you, do not have the second derivative test done correctly. Okay, second derivative. You're going to take this second derivative right here, and you're going to plug in the 2. So you're testing right on top of the critical value. That is key. Plug in the 2, you get a uh, 24 minus 30, which is a negative, and that's why he has this symbol right above the 2, okay? It's not, he's not testing to the left and to the right. That's what you do for the first derivative. Second derivative, you are right on top of the function or of the critical value. Okay, so that's going to be negative, which is downward, which is concave down, which affirms what he found by taking the first derivative test on either side of 2. Okay, then go over to the 3 and test right above it. So plug in the three into your second derivative. That's gonna give you 36 minus 30, which is positive. That's gonna make it concave up, which affirms what you saw with the first derivative test. Okay, so anybody have any questions or concerns about that? Because most of you have this incorrect. Okay, what you're not doing is you're not testing on either side of the inflection point. So your whole purpose of doing a second derivative test is to determine what's going on with your original function. Okay, so you test right on top for second derivative tests. Then to get any of the y values, so all these y values, let me just 
All these y values all came from plugging in the x value to the original function. Okay, that's where they came from. Okay, so the only thing I would add to his graph, because his graph is great, is um, way down here somewhere at negative, what, negative 24 is the y intercept. Okay, so that can ground your graph. Everything else is good. So here's his max. Here's the inflection point. Here's the min. Okay, so this is exactly what I want. Now, whenever you have a sign chart, you're going to have to do a statement. Otherwise, the sign chart doesn't really count. Okay, so let's look at the statement. At CV of 2, the slope changes from positive to negative, which yields a, ma a max. I agree. Okay, this is not what you want. I don't care where the concavity changes. What I want to know is at CV of 2, you can say that F prime prime of 2 is less than 0. That means it's concave down, which also yields a max. Okay, to get the inflection point. That's not what you're talking about when you do the sign chart. Then at CV of 3, slope changes from negative to positive, you get a min. Perfect. But you haven't done the second derivative statement. So at CV of 3, your F prime prime of 3 is greater than 0, which means it's concave up, and that gives you a min. So you are affirming what you found out in your first derivative test. Okay, so if you have uh, two critical values, and you're doing first and second derivative test, you've got four statements, okay? Okay, I know that the inflection point is where everything changes, but that's not the function of the um, of finding the second derivative and doing that test. You want to figure out what the concavity is on either side of the change. You want to know that when you say it's a max by the first derivative test, you are affirming that with your second derivative test. Okay, so don't mention where the inflection point is. That's not germane to the discussion of a sign charge. Okay, that's helpful when you are doing your your sketch, but that's not part of your sign chart. Okay, anybody have any questions about that? Because this is a key, key point. So when doing a first and second derivative test, let me just go back to a previous problem. So the first derivative test is all about slope. The second derivative test is all about concavity. It's not about inflection point. Okay, all about concavity. Okay, so I would make corrections to your paper so that you have this down solid for number seven. And going forward today, we'll do first and second derivative tests the rest of the time so that we just reinforce it. So my plan for today is I'm going to go through the rest of this document, and then we're going to look at the remaining uh, notes for two, two, three, and two, four. Okay, 2-4 is just a review of 2-3, really. So there's no new material. For the next class, we're going to have a quiz, uh, well, kind of, I guess it's kind of a quest, on these first four sections of uh, Chapter 2. Okay, so you have to be able to do these tests. You have to be able to read the graphs. You have to be able to create a sketch, <coughs> given information about the points, which was the last question on this packet. Okay, so... Let, let me keep going. So over here, I want to hit some key points here as well. So first of all, when you get to look at these graphs, you want to kind of figure out what's going on. So here's your, I should make that capital. Here is your f of x. Here's your f prime of x. And here's your f prime prime of x. Okay, so things that we want to figure out as well. Here's your year. So that's where your baseline is. So therefore, you're going to add 1,800 to the numbers that appear in the baseline. Your population is in millions. Okay, so those are the things you need to have. Okay, what was the population in 1925? So I'm going to call on people here and at home. Which graph am I going to use 
to figure out that answer. What was the population? So Olivia, I'm coming to you first. So when you looked at that question, which graph did you refer to? A, B, okay. or A, excellent. Okay, so what was the population in 1925? Next thing you need to do is figure out where is 1925? Well, here is 1900, so 1925 is right there. So you would just read up and then go over. Okay, and that's gonna be 125 million people. Okay, so you shouldn't just say 125, it should be 125 million. Okay, next thing. Approximately when was the population 25 million? So Victor, which graph do you use for that? Oh, I used the first one. Yep, I agree. Okay, you're gonna use the first one for that. So, uh, when was the population 25 million? You've got to figure out where 25 million is, draw a horizontal line across, and then down, and you get the year 1850. So I agree with that as well. Okay, so let's keep going. So Heather, I'm over to you. How fast? Was the population growing in 1950? So what graph do you use? You'd use graph B. Right, so fast, you see the word fast, quickly, all those kind of words? That is code for the first derivative. They want you to talk about the slope. Now, if you did not have graph B to work with, you would have to draw a change of line. <clears throat> excuse me, on graph A, and then use the grid to get numbers. Okay, so you have that possibility. But clearly, we don't want to do that here. We're going to use, so we use um, A for this, A for this. This is now B. So how fast was it going in 1950? Again, first find 1950, which is right here. Right, so I'm just drawing a line here, and then over. So it looks about 2.2, and that's what she has two, and that's, that's what Mason has two. 2.2 million people per year. That sounds good. Okay, when during the last 50 years was the population growing at a rate, <clears throat> okay, here's rate again, of 1.8 million people? Okay, so Jonathan, when you talk about rate, which of the three graphs do you want to use? Uh, you want to use the uh, second graph? You're going to use the derivative because rate is slope. So when uh, during the last 50 years was the population growing at a rate of 1.8 million? By 1.8 million, let me just erase some of my other lines. Okay, so here is 1.8 million. This is the first time that they want in the last 50 years. So you're going to answer just the second time. And that looks like 1975. So I agree with Mason there as well. So that's 1975. Okay, so then the last question. In what year was the population growing at the greatest rate? So you have some options there. So Sheldon, which graph do you want to use for that? Uh, the uh, last one. Yeah, I would say use the last one. Now, so let's go through the thought process here. The greatest rate is going to be an inflection point. Okay, that's number one takeaway. Greatest rate is an inflection point. So look what you're going to do. If you only had the first graph, you could kind of go up and figure out that looks about what, like what it is. But I'm not totally sure, but just kind of guessing. Okay, then you have the second graph. You could just find the map. This is the steepest point. Here again, you get a good idea, but not perfect. But look at this last graph. Here is your inflection point. Your second derivative is going to be zero. This is the easiest one to use. So you can quickly read the year 1940 off of that one. And that's why that's the best one to use. Okay, any questions about reading graphs with all three of the functions? Wait, that's right. Why would that be 1940? Because you see where right here where the function point is uh, denoted because oh. the second derivative is zero. Yeah. And it's 14. It's 140. So 140 plus 1800. Got it. 
But it's by far the easiest one to read. Okay, so then when you come over to the next page over here, okay, you've got a couple of things going on. So it says uh, determine which function is the derivative of the other. So that kind of sounds tough initially, but then if you just give it a little bit more thought, we'll figure it out. So Jordan, what did you think about for question number nine? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? So I'm going to talk about question number nine. So how do you know which one is the derivative? So you have these two functions, the red function and the blue function. And I said that one function is a derivative of the other. So what's your thought? When I was looking at the concavity of the function, I was able to differentiate between the two and figure out which one was the derivative of the other. When you're talking about concavity, what do you what do you mean? Like what what, what were your landmarks that you were looking for? Like I was like trying to differentiate between which one was like concave up or concave down, and that assisted me in figuring out which one was the derivative of the other function. And I got wait, let me open it up real quick. For that one, I believe that I got f of x as a der derivative of the g of x. So I think, so I don't think you want to do it that way. I think you want to look at the slope. So notice that this slope is always, let me just grab my pen here, is always going up, right? You have no mass there. So it's really hard to figure out how that's going to help you. Look at the blue slope. So I'm going to change color. Okay, looking at the blue slope, do you see, do you see how right here, that slope is zero? That means that- Yeah, I see that. Okay, so that means that its first derivative is going to be zero. So if the slope is zero, then the first derivative is zero. And look what's happening right here with the red function. Do you see how its value is zero? So that's going to make g of x the derivative of f of x. And then you can look further. So do you see that um, g of x, all here, you are reading below the x-axis. So that's all negative values. Well, look what happens to the slope of the blue function there. It's all negative. The slope goes to zero here, and then the rest of the time, the slope is positive. And so you would be reading positive values off of this. So the fact that the slope of the blue is, is measured by red has you identify the red curve as being the first derivative of f of x. Okay, does that make sense? So don't look at concavity, look at slope. So let me, I'm going to talk through the next one because it's a little bit clearer picture. So over here, do you see on the blue, that slope is zero right there. And right below it, I have a value of zero. So there, therefore, this red has to be the slope of f of x. So then I check it some more. And I see that the slope is positive here, pretty steeply positive. The red is pretty steep. Then it drops off to zero. And now it's going negative. It's going negative here, but at a, at a gradual rate. So I'm still thinking that it matches very well the red matches the slope of the blue. So once again, g of x is f prime of x. Okay, does that make sense, Jordan? Look at yeah, that makes slope. sense. Okay, look at the slope. Okay, good. Okay, so then we have another thing over here. So this is easy money if you can just follow along with the reasoning. So Trace, tell me uh, about your last sketch. So we're going to figure out if we have this reasoning correct. 
So what's the most important thing to do? <laughs> um, so I plotted my points first. Yes. Yes. That's exactly Sorry, right. Let's then make sure that Mason has all his points here. So we have two, two. I'm good there. Four, eight. Good there. We have X is zero. I think this is zero, eight. So we need a point there. So Mason, you've lost a point here. And then three, four. Three, four. So you just missed that one. Okay, so I'm going to use my pen, my green. Okay, so let's go through some of the reasoning. So Trace, you're correct. I plotted the first one. Okay, go through the reasoning of the, of the second point here. So if f prime of two is zero, and f prime prime of two is greater than zero, what did you say about that? Um, I said that it was Look at my. Um, I said that that was the uh, the f prime prime of two was the minimum or the min, and then the um, f prime prime of four was the max. Say the same thing. Okay, so so Mason, this can't be. Okay, in order to have a shell, what has to happen is the first derivative is zero. Zero, so okay, there. But then the second derivative has to be zero also. So that's what when, when we get a shell. So since your second derivative is greater than zero, Trace and I both agree that that's going to be concave up. Okay, so then f prime prime of three is zero. That happens at an inflection point. Now, I can't assume it's a shell because I didn't tell you anything about f prime, but I know that if my second derivative is zero, I have an inflection point. So this can't be a shell either. So I have a min and I have a max. So what I would do is go over to two. And because two is supposed to be the min, make it like a smiley face initially. Okay, so make that smiley face this way. Go over to four. Make that a frowny face because that's going to be a max. Then play connect the dots. Here it comes from that point. I go through here and I go down there. That could be a good representation of the graph that's been described by these features above. Okay, how do we feel about that? We okay? All right, so be careful knowing what to show. You've got to have both of these characteristics work. First derivative is zero and second derivative is zero. Uh, when they tell you that the first or second derivative is something other than zero, they're trying to let you know whether it's a max or a min. They've kind of done your first and second derivative test for you. Okay? So that's how that's going to work. So any questions on these, these problems? So you've got to know how to do a first and second derivative test. Um, you, want to, you have to know how to make your statement. You've got to know that um, if you are looking at reading a graph, you know which graph to look at. Words like fast uh, takes you, or rate takes you to the first derivative. Words like greatest takes you to the second derivative graph. Okay, you want to know how to, how to do the original function uh, based on this information. So, Sophia, you drew the other the other features on it. Yeah. But they weren't correct. That took a long time. Yeah, good. Because you can't try to draw the other features. Okay, so if you had something like this, uh, what I would say, okay, so for, I only have one inflection point, so it's going to be here, and then I am concave up, so if I'm concave up, it is positive, so my second derivative is going to go through here. Okay, so that would have been my second derivative had I asked you to sketch that on it. Then for the first derivative, and I'll change color, I would have had a zero here. I would have had a zero here. Then where I have the inflection point, 
which is at the x value of 3, that would have been my steepest positive section. So that's going to be a max. So let's just say that's here. I don't know the I don't know the y value, but I know it's going to be a max. So this is what my first derivative would look like. Okay. So you you aim over the inflection point tells you the root of the second derivative, and the max and the min tell you the root of the first derivative. And the inflection point tells you either the max or the min of the first derivative. So you can always get those other sketches, but I'm not going to ask you to do that at this point. Okay, so that's the end of that. So let me stop sharing for a sec so I don't get glitchy here. And what we're going to do next is go back into your notes. So your chapter two notes. And I want to I want to show you some real life applications of what we're learning. Okay, so it's not just as a um, an exercise in math, but it can be used as a diagnostic tool as well. So I'm on page 16 of the notes. So see if you can get yourself there, and then we're going to talk through each one. <laughs> now I'll get my notes up as well. Okay, so so this is a little bit different than what we've been doing, and I'll tell you why. Here's this. Okay, so in this situation, this was like the extra material for the section. It was, it's extra because I give you n points to consider. So when you're given a domain restriction, you want to also test those, those values to see whether maybe they're a max or a min. So you have a little bit of an extra uh, test to do. But I'm going to say for our practice, I would like to do a first and second derivative test. So let's I'll write that here. So we're going to do first and second derivative test with the chart. And then I'm going to say test y value of n point. So here is a practical application of what we're learning. A company has found that its weekly profit from the sales of X units of an auto part is given by this expression, this equation. Production bottlenecks limit the number of units that can be made per week to no more than 150. Okay, so 150 is your max. So X has to be less than or equal to 150. While a long-term contract requires that at least 50 units be made each week. So it has to also be greater than or equal to 50. This is your domain restriction. Find the max maximum possible weekly profit that the firm can make. So you're going to find the profit, but you're going to do it by maximizing X. Okay, so then once you get your maximum, then you can prove what the profit is. So go ahead and start taking your derivative. And I will do it as well, but I'm not going to do it live. So I'm going to stop sharing, let you work on it. I'll work on it here so I can show it to you. And then we'll come back and talk about it. Okay.
How are we doing? Yeah, I'm just going to take a view of how like, the derivative applies to finding like the the process because like, I'm just like plugging it on. Like, I'm just so you're going to do the same thing we've been doing. So in order to figure out the maximum profit, you want to see what the maximum of the function is, right? So you're going to find that by doing the first derivative step and then the second derivative step to affirm it. Okay. So take your first derivative, that it equals a zero, factor it, get your critical value. You only have one of them because you can get two of them, but you have to not use one of them because it doesn't fall inside the domain. Sure. Then go ahead and do everything the same. Okay. You're going to do your test. The only different thing is at the very end of the problem, <coughs> after you figure out your maximum profit at the vertex, then just check the endpoint. Make sure that that y value doesn't exceed the y value you just found at the max. And then that's it, you're done. Okay. okay? Okay, so those of you at home, how are you doing? Because I had the same thing happen in the other class that, that they froze because they couldn't find the application of this to what we had done previously. Okay, so you're doing the same idea, take your first derivative, and then go through all the steps that we've just gone through. And I want you to do a first and second derivative test to figure out to get first the maximum input that's going to give you the maximum profit. A few minutes, just gonna walk around here and then I will get back to you at home. Okay, so how are you? Um, well, your x has to be between 50 and 150 because of the production issue. So when you, see, I factored out point of six, and then I got this, which gave me those factors. So you're off by a power of 10. Okay, you can't use this one, right? Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. Yeah. This is negative, and then so it's negative zero, right? And when you plug that back into the first derivative, so what is the back? What has to be? Uh, well, I'm trying to find the point. Like, the second derivative. So the second derivative test isn't a test of the inflection point. Oh, just kidding. Sorry. Wait. Yeah. Because what you're going to do, you're going to do a sine chart, right? And then I did do it. On, I did it on paper today. But above the sine chart, right here, you're going to plug a hundred into here. It's going to be negative. Therefore, that's going to affirm the fact that it's concave down. Okay. Okay, so and don't worry about the inflection point. point. Uh, is there an inflection point? There's not. Is there any way in the world that this can equal zero? Well, facing zero, yeah, so it's going to be at x is zero, which will be at zero comma 20,000. So you would plug it back into the original equation. Right. To get okay. every single y, put so back to the original equation. Got it. Okay, so every yeah, so I'll make my sign zero. Yeah. And then there's just one point, right? It's just 100. So you just go one yes. hundred less. But then remember, you're going to check the endpoints too to make sure that those don't give you a higher profit yield. And I didn't ask you to sketch this either, so you don't need to worry about sketching the final solution. So therefore, you really don't need the inflection point for this. Wait, that's right. He plugged, he plugged the, I don't know, you would plug 100 back, if you're like whatever left right now going to the first group or the original? So first you're doing the first derivative test. So yes. left and right is going into the first derivative. Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, I always think that was good. Yeah, plug it in to test the slope. Yeah, so now is the new roller now? Um, I think I'm good. Yeah, so, yeah, so now you're good. Yeah. So then, get your second derivative, <coughs> and right on top of the 100, do that test. Is it your thing turned around? Uh, I think so. Okay. All right, so how is everyone doing at home? Heather, how are you doing? Um, I'm good. <laughs> okay. Like, I, th I think I'm getting it, but I also think I'm missing some things. Okay. All right, so we're gonna, just about getting ready to share my screen. We'll do that in just a sec. Jordan, how are you doing? I think I'm getting it so far. Okay, do you have a critical value? No, not yet. I'm, I'm like halfway done with it so far. But so far, so good. Okay, so I'm going to start sharing my screen to see where you are. Okay, so, so I wrote in here what we have to do. So here, here's some of my work. So I took the first derivative. I then factored out a negative 0 0.06. That gave me x squared minus 10,000. I then factored that and got x plus and minus 100. I couldn't use the x equals minus 100 because that's not within my domain restriction. It also makes no sense from a business point of view to tell, tell a boss, great idea, make negative 100 units and you'll maximize your profit. Okay, you can't make negative 100 units, so therefore I didn't even consider it. Any number that you're not considering doesn't go on your sign chart. So only 100 is on my sign chart. I have my endpoints here, but I'm not checking the slope there because that's not a vertex. It's not a max or a minimum situation. So first derivative, I tested, I think I picked like, I don't know, 70, and I plugged it in here and here and got positive times negative times negative, which is a positive. Then I tested 110. I plugged it in here, got a positive. Here, got a positive. This is still negative, so negative times positive times positive is a negative. So my slope is going from positive to negative. I then took my second derivative right here. Don't solve for the inflection point. That's not our purpose of second derivatives right now. We want to test the concavity at the max or min. So take your 100, plug it in here, right here, and you get a negative. So that makes this concave down, which affirms what you noticed by the pattern of the slope just a moment ago. So my statement is as follows. At CB equals 100, the slope changes from positive to negative. Therefore, I have a max. So here I've used the word slope. Then that's the first derivative test statement. My second derivative test statement says at CB equals 100, F prime prime of 100 is less than zero, which means it's concave down, which also tells me I have a max. Okay, so then I took all my x values. I took my critical values, got the x values, so this is the critical point now. Then I took my endpoints and got the y values here, endpoint y value here. My maximum profit happens with my production level of 100 units, because I get a profit there of $20,000. At the end points, I have 7,500 and 2,500 respectively. So that's less profit. So the profit, that's the maximum value I can get, happens at 100 units, and it is $20,000. Okay, so you don't need a sketch for this. And 
there's no need to find the inflection point because you're not sketching it. But you need the second derivative to do the second derivative test. Okay, so what do you think? Questions from the home front or from the uh, school front? Does that make sense? Yeah. Miles, what do you think? Um, yeah, so why wouldn't you use the, um, the negative 100? I was going to say, why would you use the 150? Um, so I plugged it in because it's an endpoint. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always on the lookout. If they give you endpoints, always check your endpoints because you can get a possible endpoint solution. That maybe your max is not a vertex. Maybe your max is just the max part of the function. Right. So always check it if they give you the endpoint. Otherwise, you're just going to rely upon your first and second derivative test to, to evaluate that critical value. Okay. okay? I doubt it, Riley. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit confused. Can you just restate that second statement? So for the second derivative test? Yeah. Okay, so I would say at the critical value of 100, the second derivative evaluated at 100 is less than zero. Therefore, the function is concave down, which yields a max. Okay. So you have to discuss concavity with the second derivative test, and you've got to discuss slope with the first derivative. So that's why I need to have those words in there. Okay? Because I only have one point. I have, you know, one statement for each of the tests. If yeah. I had, you know, a second critical value, I'd have double the point. Okay. Double the statement. Is there ever going to be a situation in which the first derivative is zero, but the second derivative is? Because that would yeah. make a shell, right? So what, what is that? If the first derivative and second derivative are both zero, you have a shell. So I'm saying, what if the first one, what if the first derivative is zero, but the second derivative is not zero? Well, that's what we have. Uh, that's when you have max and mins, right? That's exactly what we want to have. Yeah. Because it would be an unusual situation in that situation. So, and that's a good point, because what if you have the first derivative and the second derivative both uh, zero? Then your critical value gives you a max, which gives you an endpoint solution. Because then if it's constantly going up, you would produce at the endpoint, right? Uh -huh. That would be your maximum profit. Okay. So that's a situation where if you have a shell, that's not going to be your solution for a maximum profit. But instead, you're going to see it in the endpoint. So yeah, that would be an interesting situation. Okay, so anybody have questions about this at home? Because I'm trying to get you to practice some more, and also to understand that this is the application, okay, so that there's no need to ask me if I want to ever use this. This is a very good example of when you would use this. Okay, so let, can, I, can we go on to the next one? And what I'll do is I will post this video so that you can go back over this discussion as well. So I'll post it on today's class, okay? So let's keep going in the interest of time. So look at the next problem. It's another practical application. This is a pollution application. So you have a marshy region used for agricultural drainage, and it's becoming contaminated with selenium. It has been determined that flushing the area with clean water will reduce the selenium for a while, but it will then begin to build up again. A biologist has found that the percent of selenium in the soil X months after the flushing is given by this formula. When will the selenium be reduced to a minimum? Whenever you see that, a minimum or a maximum, you're doing the first derivative and second derivative test. We want first derivative, second derivative. We want the chart for the sign chart. So sign chart and statement. Okay? Then, because you have endpoints, here's your endpoints. X is in months. And we're doing this over a one year period. So you're going to be testing your endpoints to make sure that they're not the best solution, that that's not the minimum. Okay, so you're, you want to get the minimum percent, which means you need the y value, but first you need to get the x value. Other thing, look at this function. You have to do the quotient rule to get your first derivative. Okay, so do the quotient rule get your first derivative, and then start working through the problem. 
And we'll do the same thing. So I'll start doing it on my end, and then I'll come on and talk about it with you. So remember, uh, quotient rule is low D high minus high D low over low squared. Oh, excuse me, Dr. Riley. Go ahead, Apparently, I have a doctor's appointment today at three, so um, I think I, I might have to leave class. Okay, that's okay. So I'm going to post this video, his assignment, so you can listen to, look at the rest of it when you get home, okay? Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome. What are you getting for first derivative? Wait, okay, that's fine. Wait, quick question. When I'm doing low d high minus high d low, am I is x squared plus 36 together, or are they two separate? I'm, I'm forgetting. So you can just take the derivative from right to left. Okay. So, so let's do that together. So low 2x minus 36 yeah. is just 2x also. Yeah. Minus high, which is the whole x squared plus 36, okay, yeah. times uh, d low, which is 2, all over the whole low squared. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
for session of his. Yeah. Did you get 4x squared minus 2x squared plus 72 over 4x squared? It goes up minus 72 because you can distribute that negative. Yes, sorry, minus 72. When we factor out the, I don't know, like that, when we subtract negative 2x from 4x squared? Yep, so you can do that. That gives you 2x squared minus 72 over 4x squared. Then I factored out in the numerator the 2. So I have 2 times x squared minus 36. And then over 4x squared. Then I, I, I canceled the 2 in the numerator with a 2 in the denominator. And ended up with x squared minus 36 over 2x squared. Then you'll do the quotient rule that gets you the second derivative, right? Yes. Which everything falls out very nicely. <coughs> How is the quotient rule coming at home? Katie, how are you doing? Um, it was a little hard at first, but I think I'm doing pretty good now. Yeah, you just start thinking about quotient rule again, and then cleaning things up. What are you up to? Uh, second derivative minus half out. Which is a lot. 36 over x squared. So, what did you get your first derivative to be in its final form? x squared minus 36 over 2x squared. Right, okay. When did you get your second derivative, Dr. Riley? Well, that's what I'm just looking at now. So let me just do 2x times the, yeah, those should be the, the 4x cubed cancel, right? Yeah. So they cancel, and then I'm left with a negative, yeah, I'm, I'm left with a negative times negative, so a positive 144x yeah. over 4x to the fourth. Yeah. Okay, and then that's all I need to worry about because when I plug in my critical value in there, it's going to be positive no matter what. A sign of utility sentence. You don't have to do this because it's going to be positive. Oh. I'm not sure where I got lost. 
and convert your answer is what it should say. Convert your answer. Okay, so we want to do a first and second derivative tests. So go ahead, let's take five minutes and get, get this one done. Uh, this is an easier factoring problem. It's just straight up power rule. And uh, go ahead and run through your first and second derivative test and see if you can get me the answers to A, B, and C. Uh, Dr. Adam, uh -huh. can you go back up to the bottom of number C? Uh huh. Thank you. Quest, could we write like the statement in that form, or do yeah. we have to use more, so we can we can do yeah. numbers and stuff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, five it. Good? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna stop sharing, and I'm gonna start working on this problem. I uh, you can just do the thing.
put a word problem on this question. So if you are reading graphs, you're doing first and second derivative test, and you are analyzing graphs to say which is the first derivative, second derivative, and so on. Okay, so let me share, start sharing this just in the interest of time. Salmon question. So taking your first derivative, you should discover that your critical value is 12. Your second derivative ends up being this, negative 6x plus 6. And here's my sign chart. The slope is changing from positive to negative at 12. And the second derivative, when I plug in 12 into the second derivative, I get a negative, which tells me it's concave down and it affirms the fact that I have a max. Okay, then write your critical value statement. Critical value of 12, the slope changes from positive to negative, it yields a max. At the critical value of 12, the second derivative evaluated at 12 is less than zero, and therefore it's concave down, which gives me a max as well. So the temperature was 12 degrees, the number of salmon coming up the river. 8,024, and changing the temperature to Celsius gives me a temperature of 54 degrees. So it's pretty cool water that they're coming up in. Okay, so I'll put this video up once I get it all loaded. Uh, to get ready for this quiz, I would say go over these three problems because they'll give you good practice. And then could you also do where it says 2.4 more practice on curves catching number 19. And since we're not going over 19 right now, I'll go over before the quiz to make sure there's no questions on it. <coughs> Dr. Riley. Go ahead, Andy. Um, I just have a question about what you plugged in to get a negative for the slope between 12 and 20. Like, I understand why it has to be a negative, but everything I plugged in, it kept coming up positive. Oh, because I didn't plug it into the derivative. That's why, sorry. Because they, sometimes you can miss the negative three in front too. So yeah, just plug it into the derivative because you are finding the slope, right? And then don't forget the negative three because that multiplies it and turns, um, you know, turns the sign Okay, thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord, I thank you for having given me life, for having made me to know love, and serve you all the days of my life and for eternity. I thank you for my faith, for the school day I am completing. I beg your pardon for my offenses and omissions of the day, and I resolve to make tomorrow a better day. With me as I live out the rest of this day, may I do so in your holy grace and good favor. Amen. Amen. Our Lady of Good Counsel, Amen. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Riley. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll let you guys go at home, and I'll post this video a little later. Thank you. Bye-bye.